you know, unlike the other speakers who are all known for some years, Jens is someone I only recently met. Unfortunately, I had to wait the first 55 years of my life to meet him. Uh, could have happened earlier. So I can't do these old boys or old fogies club kind of, you know, cozy introductions. I have to be serious. But at least I can say that we have something in common that we both know Andrew Blake. <laughs> he did his PhD under Andrew Blake, uh, you know, some years ago and worked on, amongst other things, motion and video annotation. So clearly something I should know about. Uh, right now he's at GE. Oh, I like that slide that was there before, energizing, optimizing. All kinds of uh, HR type of words were there, right? Oh, oh the background. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we are proud to have, privileged to have him here. Have you been to the GE lab in? Uh, yeah, I've worked right there last week. Yeah. So he's actually here as a guest of the GE. Are you running away? No, I Not you, Rama. Are you? Yes, okay. Um, you know, we are proud to have him. I, uh, he gave a talk at ICVGIP a couple of days ago. Uh, this talk is not about medical imaging. No, it is. It is? Okay. Yeah. Some of the title… Uh, you changed the title. I changed the title as well. Uh, last minute switch on. <laughs> Bait and switch. I know you all came expecting, you know, a very interesting talk on… Uh, well, it's like… It wasn't the talk. Anyway, something else. It was something about why Validation. you don't want to do something. I forgot what it was. <laughs> okay. But you will get a more interesting talk on something like this. The talk is actually close to the abstract um, I, I, I published that's on the website. The abstract was more about validation and I thought I should um, provide you a little, with a little bit more context. And um, what I did in uh, the conference in Chennai, I basically talked about various applications and um, I presented more or less what kind of algorithms we developed. Um, for tracking, for segmentation, and for model fitting that sort of really enable um, applications in, in molecular biology. So in a way, this talk is more the working version of the same kind of material where I want to sort of reflect on what difficulties do we face going into this domain and what are the expectations we have to meet. So it's probably a little bit more rough around the edges and some things I, I will miss, so I briefly just illustrate here. Um, at the, I talked about the, the basically the way of taking anatomical measurement from zebrafish using um, basically an anatomical atlas. This zebrafish is five days old. It has the nice, probab uh, nice property that it is. Um, translucent at, at five days, 120 hours after fertilization, so you can just put it on the microscope. And uh, the interesting thing is we use similar algorithms we use for face fitting to actually fit the anatomical model to the zebrafish, and then you can basically write applications where the um, biologist take images from a high throughput microscope and take um, up to 14 measurements basically in a very automated way um, through this kind of um, atlas-based measurements. So previously, all this was done by hand, and people basically used Photoshop and take measurements of all the different organs. But I don't want to really dwell on that anymore. Um, the goals for today are still sort of um, some work to motivate the need for biological imaging. and. Um, where I really deviate from, from the other talk is I'm going much closer into algorithm validation, review some validation strategies, and finally I sort of want to almost put up a loose proposal and a discussion um, around the community effort for um, looking at histology images. So um, to keep things a little bit interesting, Columbus never reached India. So the time, the map at the time was basically um, America was missing the distance, the sea distance from Europe to um, Asia was basically just estimated. Columbus didn't even trust the um, current experts at the time. He basically consulted with the church and they basically said, well, it is probably just about 2,000 uh, 2, kilometers and you just have to sail west. So he ended up in America. 
Where are we today? You can pick up any biology book and you will see beautiful maps of pathways and they're more or less hierarchical. You can basically expand on any one of those and you will find a similar map of similar complication. But there's still a lot of things we ignore. We, for instance, ignore that there's crosstalk between pathways and to illustrate that in a sort of very simple way is when... Um, okay, you, you know, at least me, what's a molecular pathway? Um, okay, molecular pathways is essentially life at the molecular scale is determined through signaling events. Signaling events can be <clears throat> either pro uh, through proteins, they can be through um, electrical um, impulses, and what, the, what basically happens, these are signaling cascades. So basically one event will trigger the next, and th what, what essentially can this happens, all what we observe, um, cell division, cell death, is basically governed through those um, signaling cascades. So what we're trying to do, if, if we, for instance, want to control processes in the sense that we want to um, devise methods to basically um, cure diseases, basically drugs, we are basically looking at a specific target in that pathway, address it, modify it, and um, basically stop certain things from happening or encourage certain things from happening. So what, what I'm trying to illustrate is that today we have a fairly simplified view of this in the sense that we will look at one pathway at a time. For instance, um, drug developers will look at this particular pathway in this particular spot and say this is the drug target. What, what happens in practice is that nothing happens in isolation and a very simple way to, uh, to illustrate that is, for instance, our natural, our diet, what, basically what we eat and drink every day, influences the function of those pathways. So a very, a very um, straightforward example is this. If you take antidepressants and you drink grapefruit juice, you are very highly likely to suffer horrible toxicity because basically natural substances in grapefruit juice will, um, will neutralize certain aspects of that pathway, and this is basically an event people that designed that drug never foresaw. So you saw my point. My point is that with our current level of, of, of life at a sort of, of functions at a molecular level, we are still at a fairly early stage, and um, there will probably be need to revise some of the um, discoveries we've made today. So, the second thing is, I'm not sure if you ever were interested in that, but at the time there was a great race to the South Pole, and um, Robert Falcon Scott, who was the um, British contender, came second. The reason he came second is he simply underestimated the challenges of the environment. He thought he could read the South Pole with motorized sleds and horses. Um, so Amundsen was basically, he was Norwegian, grew up basically over years living in the snow. He stuck to fairly sort of proven methods and basically arrived at the South Pole um, quite, quite a few days before him. The reason I basically want to illustrate this is what methods of discovery are we using today to sort of look at the function of, of proteins and genes. So the example I'm giving you here, that's basically a method that's, base, that's used in many labs today is called electrophoresis. What you essentially do is you, you take your tissues or you take your cells, you grind them up, you put them on a basically electrophoresis is, um, is, is essentially a chemical grid. So and then you look, how do the spots move on, on, on these two gradients? And you basically look at what are the changes in those little peaks that move around. So when you look at this, is, um, these images have nothing to do with actual cellular structures or even tissue structures. They, they, they mix the entire cell population together so you get a very global um, analysis of what's actually going on. If there are certain 
Um, small deviations, you will not see this because you basically take uh, an, an estimate of a large population. A method that's a little bit more refined is the method of flow cytometry. Here you basically have a channel and you have cells flying by that channel and you take a measurement. So at least you don't disaggregate the, disaggregate the single cell, but you know, have no idea about tissue structure. You have no idea on what is actually happening in, in the neighborhood of that cell when it's in the living environment. You basically also have just a very abstract measurement. So what's the motivation for biomedical imaging? So modern microscope techniques allow us to actually image biological processes over time and in the context of the organization of the tissue. So we don't have to disaggregate the tissue like you saw in the previous examples. We can basically just take um, either a, a cell population or even, uh, or even a, a, a tissue and image certain signaling events. This were basically events we saw on the previous slide in that context. So hence it is sort of monitored to model biological processes in, in the spatial context. And very importantly where we come in is we take automatic quantitative measurements and inferences from those images. And I will sort of give examples throughout my talk what kind of quantitative measurements they are and what inferences they allow. Do you have any questions so far? So what I want to explain to you next is um, sort of an end-to-end -end workflow. Um, we have developed a GE Global Research that allows to, to basically monitor a large amount of proteins in the single section of the tissue. So what you see in the background is um, what you would expect to see from a normal uh, pathology slide and what you see on t overlaid on top of this in the various colors are sort of the expressions of proteins in the different channels. And I will explain to you now how these images are generated and what kind of inferences we hope to make from those images. So the process, we call that sequential multiplexing. Um, what you do is you take a certain stain. What a stain does is when you're interested in a certain protein, you basically can develop a molecular marker that will attach to that protein. So you take, as said before, you take that protein, you stain the image, then you inactivate that protein through uh, what is called a chemical in activation step, you take your next round of staining, you take the new protein you're interested, and you basically go through this process in sequential fashion until you've basically interrogated all the proteins you're interested in that kind of experiment you're running. What are you getting out is um, you're getting a map of the tissue out, and the reason that is the case is because in we can basically have geometrical, use, use uh, stains as geometrical markers. So for, and to be precise, we use normal DAPI staining to stain all the nuclei. Um, that stain is not affected in all the different rounds of staining. So we use that. We can register all those images together, generate a digital map of the tissue, and then quantify the different uh, proteins. I explained to you the imaging uh, work in this process in a little bit more detail. So as I said before, we have all the different channels. We register them together. So um, as you can imagine, this registration has to be pretty precise. So we register up to 60 to 100 images together. What happens at that point is also you have to suppress um, something what you call autofluorescence. So what, uh, what you do if you do fluorescence microscopy, there's some natural fluorescence in the tissue. You basically have to, um, you have to eliminate to get, um, to be able to quantify all the protein information. Then we do the segmentation. We basically identify um, 
nuclei, cytoplasm, and membrane from every image, and then you can do the quantitation, which you then hand over to uh, generate a cancer score, uh, do the protein analysis. So how does the single cell measurement, can, how can the single cell measurement look like? So for instance, out of this tissue staining, you arrive this kind of, um, this kind of segmentation, then you basically have the, the, um, the areas of each cell mapped out. In this case, it's just illustrated basically the, the whole area for each cell. Each cell gets an ID, and then you can measure the different proteins, and I show you that in a more complete example. Just to give you an idea of what kinds of um, proteins are routinely measured um, and how different their expression can be, is sort of, for example, here that's in a, um, a marker which highlights whether a cell proliferates, means it's, it's going through mitosis. That's called Ki67. Um, P53, for some of you who follow um, bioscience literature a little bit, is, um, it's, a, it's a cancer suppressant gene, so you can highlight whether P, P53 is active or not. Some of the other, men other measurements are used to highlight certain um, structures in each cell. Yes. No. Um, so the whole process works because um, either when we work on cells, they are fixed, or in tissues, we actually work on archival tissues. So the nice thing is we can basically just take um, histology sections from the lab, remove the cover slip, and put them through this process. Because that's really of interest is, um, as you can imagine, ultimately we are, we are interested in clinical applications, so you really want to access tissue that's been routinely generated and processed. So histology slides with cover slips is basically um, what, we, what we're going to use. So what I also um, want to mention, and obviously I've talked about proteins, there's um, Genetic information is of, of incredible importance because certain genes can be indicators, early indicators for disease. So there's a method called FISH, in situ, in situ fluorescence hyper, into, uh, sorry, I don't get the acronym quite right now. But the, um, essentially what, what it is, is you can highlight certain gene motifs um, using fluorescence and um, you can overlay that information on the protein expression. Um, the finest resolution we are working at at the moment is about 40x. That means um, a cell has about, a nucleus has about 15 microns in diameter. So that gives you a, a so what we can, we can't really image fine substralure, uh, subs, uh, subcellular structures in the nucleus, okay? But through the, um, through the means of molecular markers, you could, for instance, see the concentration of DNA, but you wouldn't be able to see the DNA spindles. So this is at a level higher than sort of this very high resolution microscopy you see um, in some of the journals. So this is, um, now I'm trying to sort of build up one example. Here in the first round, you will basically stain the membrane. Let's not too worry about the, uh, much about the markers now. Then in a subsequent round, you would stain um, the cytoplasm. You go on, you stain the nuclei. Um, and what you should observe here is also that um, the nuclei are sort of partially overlapping. And I haven't got that on slides, but um, one um, aspect that's often overlooked in tissue imaging is that you actually look at the partial volume. So even, even the, um, the cut tissue slice is very thin, you still see overlapping nuclei. 
so we don't see a perfect plane. So some, some, some of the cells will basically get cut in the middle, some will be cut at a, at a sort of top end or low end. So all these, all these um, effects basically produce artifacts in the image. Um, you can't sort of assume that for the purpose of segmentation, every cell is sort of a nice center cut um, object that has a perfect nucleus, a perfect cytoplasm, and a perfect uh, membrane. So these are the kinds of um, segmentation we can routinely generate now. And uh, what you also see, these segmentations are by no means perfect, um, but they are sort of right now used as a map to quantify um, all those different proteins that are layered on top, as I illustrated before. So what you do with a single cell um, segmentation information, so you can basically give an ID to every cell, um, and for every cell and every structure, you can basically generate um, a lot of features in the sense of morphological features and of protein expression. So you can quantify the protein expression for each of the different areas independently. Yes, please. Oh, it is, um, no, it is, uh, in this case, it really has to be automatic because um, what, what happens in, in, um, in practical experiments is that um, scientists will stain what one calls, um, say for the example of tissue microarrays, these are basically slides that have like tissue spots on them. They will stain a, f a few number of slides, so you will end up with hundreds of these tissue spots. They will basically say, based on the cancer type, there are certain high-level parameters. They say, for instance, um, we're trying to make it intuitive for them. So we say these are either big cells or small cells or um, whatever. And they basically also, uh, they also determine what kind of markers they have used. But then this entire batch of, of, of slides is basically processed in a back-end server automatically. So, Um, well, it depends about, actually the segmentation time is, is not so critical. I mean, we can segment these um, images in minutes, but what is maybe more important that each experiment generates about two, terab uh, yeah, two terabytes of data. So you generate an enormous amount of data in every run that then has to be analyzed. And what is also, and I think that relates already a little bit to the second, to the um, points I want to make uh, uh, on later is that anything that fails in the process slows the entire analysis of the experiment down a lot because imagine you have so many different images then you find out that some of the images for instance are not segmented well some of the images are not registered so they're getting very annoyed if like portions of that pipeline break and they basically then have to debug and fix um, these kinds of issues. So what we're going to do afterwards, and this is probably at a more experimental stage right now, is we visualize these expression patterns. We're trying to determine what kind of structure is in there. We're trying to determine um, what kind of disease-relevant information can be extracted from that. Um, and just to give you a, a little bit of a background, we're working at the moment with um, Eli Lilly and a couple of other pharmaceutical collaborators on preclinical studies. What that means is they basically come to us and say, hey, we're working on drug XYZ. We just want to see, um, can your process tell us anything about the patients we have enrolled in a clinical trial? So what, what that means is can you basically see if a person um, expresses a certain molecular profile that's interesting for that trial? And also, I mean, maybe a little bit more background information. This kind of activity is, is highly um, relevant for them because every person you enroll on such a trial costs an enormous amount of money because these people basically have to go through certain exams. There have to be, there has to be follow-up and all uh, stuff like that. 
Now I've talked about tissues. Um, you can do the same experiment on uh, stem cells. You can basically monitor, you can have stem cell differentiation, let it run for a certain amount of time, and then you just look at all the known stem cell markers and you run this kind of process to characterize the stem cell populations in terms of their health, in terms of their differentiation state, and this has a fair number of applications ranging from tissue engineering to um, now what people call cell therapies to just basic research. So in short, we have a, developed a process that generates very high content data on tissues as well as fixed cells. And um, here just some more examples on um, from an ongo ongoing prostate cancer study. So you see there's a fair number of variation in the images. So here you see sort of line, nicely outlined ducts. Um, here the, the, the structure is much less clear. So the, the whole interpretation depends on disease state as well as staining variations. So now if you ask yourself the question that we are imaging researchers and we sort of play a role in this overall pipeline, how good do our algorithms have to be to basically ensure success of projects that are fairly sizable and um, actually have uh, some risk of failure associated to them as well? And we discussed this at a recent meeting at Genelia Farms, which is sort of, it has been mentioned before, the Howard Hughes Institute, where people argued, um, we really expect vision algorithms to be extremely robust and reliable. If we don't get close to 100% performance, we don't even want to look at this. So uh, Jitendra Malik was in the crowd, and he said, well, why do you need such high precision? This is really not necessarily achievable. And the reason is that um, in the state of exploring the data, people are very afraid that noise and other contaminations like imperfect segmentation corrupt the data and lead us in a wrong way. So they really, they, they, they really put a lot of pressure on us to see, really, we want to see perfect results. Once we have a hypothesis, we can drill down and do a lot more focused analysis. So that relates to the challenges. We are expected to produce very robust segmentation for the different tissue types. And um, the variation from tissue to tissue can be very substantial. So it is not even clear that they can use the same algorithm for, for instance, prostate tissue as you could use for, for brain tissue. What is still an open question is the understanding of the inherent variability in the data. So this is not only the variation in terms of shape and structure, this is also the variation in terms of protein expression. So for instance, slides from different patients have not normally the same protein content. Sli um, experiments from different runs can look very different. So, so far, we're still in the process of characterizing the overall process performance meaning if we would have a different segmentation algorithm, would it actually change the end result? This is not such a trivial question to ask because you're looking at a fairly complicated pipeline. I've already mentioned to you that the actual act of hypothesis generation is um, by no means trivial. We are basically going, we investigated processes we don't know much about, or we investigated processes where our Knowledge is very idealized. So I, this is why I showed you the, um, the slide about the pathway and saying in an ideal setting, this pathway looks like this. There's no guarantee that in the actual patient, we will see a similar picture. And finally, I think what's exciting right now that we are basically at the stage that we can correlate protein expression with cellular morphology. We can basically correlate what um, pathologists have done over more than 100 years with something that's pretty much current of our time looking at protein expression. 
So that, in a way, sets the stage um, for the second part of my talk. What I briefly want to mention is, are we the only groups that build such complicated pipelines and basically look at end-to-end -end applications? By no means we are. This is just an example of the group uh, um, that's headed by Gene Myers and Han Chuang Peng that look at the, the brain of the fly, the, yeah, the brain of the fly. They're trying to reconstruct all the neural distributions and connections in the fly brain, and the brain has about 100,000 neurons. And this is also done using optical imaging. They have a robot that basically takes the fly out of little breeding containers, images them, and they're processing about a 400 fly brains a day. So there again, the, um, the constraint is you want to go through a lot of data fairly quickly in a reliable fashion because you don't want to go back to um, the image 261 because your atlas somehow can't fit the data. So what are the main points? So assessing data quality is, um, is a very important issue, and I'm trying to give you some ideas on uh, how we're starting to address that. The main issue I want to talk about is um, the validation of the analysis algorithms, and I've already mentioned that supporting exploratory data analysis is, is a very important activity. So let's look at the quality um, of data First, what you see here, this is sort of the beautiful stained image. You would expect, um, uh, basically, in a high-quality publications like Nature, um, a lot of work goes into generating those images. And I think, as vision people, we often underestimate that these images are results of weeks, if not months, work in the lab to just generate something that looks perfect. So a development which is also happening right now is basically slide scanning for normal histology uh, is getting digitized. So in a, in a way, you see the same revolution that you saw in radiology a while ago. All that data will become digital. It will become, um, in a way, ubiquitous. We can view it um, remotely. And there the question is, can we assess the quality of these histology images? So the first aspect we looked at was um, the image focus, because that's essentially the first thing a pathology looks, pathologist looks at. Is the image in focus? Is it actually fit so I can make a read of the image? So as I said, we can give a feedback to the pathologist using these automated methods if the image is actually OK, if we think on based what we've trained at that the quality is, uh, the focus quality is high. What we can also do, we can basically provide online control to an actual digital slide scanner. And we can say, look, if the, if the slide is actually out of focus, we really want to reacquire it one more time because the workflow of pathology slides in the clinic is actually rather complicated um, because slides can only be in a lab for a certain time. They have to be archived. There's the risk that they get lost um, and stuff like that. So what approach did we take? We defined a focus measurement. We looked at about, and we looked at it as a binary problem. We just decided between in focus and out of focus. Um, originally, pathologists asked us to look at three different uh, categories but just analyzing their manual annotations basically indicated that the soft focus category was basically so inconsistent from pathology to pathology that we decided up front this is not really possible to differentiate between that. So we utilize an extensive set of photo disc uh, focus discriminative features. We're basically going to show you in the next slide what kind of features we use. And what is sort of the point of this work is that we're trying to compare an automatically generated data set with manual annotations done um, by pathologists. 
So this is the list of features. Sorry, this slide is a little bit small, but there's nothing unusual um, you would expect. We're looking at local contrast. We're looking at gradients and Laplacian features. We're looking at wavelet. Here's a whole family of wavelet features. We look at local statistics. We basically use everything we can sort of compute. This is a rather exploratory study, and it's not me meant to actually process the data in sort of a minimal amount of time. Um, the method of classification is nothing unusual either. We basically use regions. We extract the 44 measurements in windows at about a size of 128, 128, or, or slightly bigger. And then we train an adder boost classifier to see if a given patch is out of focus or in focus. So it's sort of nice when we do these machine learning methods, you can describe algorithms in just a couple of sentences. Everybody knows what you're doing. So what's the experimental setup? We evaluate the focus quality on the whole slide. Um, and we introduce a training set that we generate through setting basically the Z of a, uh, the, the stage of a confocal microscope that we vary the, um, well, what one calls the Z resolution. I'm going to show you this in the next illustration here. We basically choose the optimal focus plane, then we move the microscope out, outside of the focal plane in both directions, and basically generate images um, at, at, different, at different Z values. So what is also, what you should also appreciate in some of those images, once they're projected and you see them on the screen, you will see hardly any difference. So you really have to look at a, at a high resolution monitor to see the differences. And um, what I started to appreciate is pathologists have an incredibly very tra trained eye. So you have to look twice if a nucleus is actually so far out of focus that you can't really make an assessment of its interior or whether the detail is there. So using this method, this is fairly easy to generate um, a fair amount of training data. We use 140,000 positive and roughly 560,000 negative samples for training the classifier. What do the results look like? Well, you basically see the overlays here just illustrated in, uh, in green and red. So here what you can see is um, typically at the edges of tissues, you get, um, you get a little bit of tissue warping, so you expect some out of focus features here. But some of you might see that this is actually an area that's fairly washed out. So we can sort of classify this as being out of focus. Now, what's the purpose, or why am I showing you all those slides, is um, we here compare the automatically generated data with the manually annotated data. And you, you see, although the classification results are not perfect in either case, but you see that the manual annotated data is so inconsistent that at 40x, we can't even make a decision what is in focus and what is out of focus. We basically, for all the different z values, we get um, we decide that it's in focus where when we use our, our basically controlled, in a controlled environment, acquired training data, we get a very reasonable discrimination. So at the optimal focal plane and one micron above, we get, um, we get a good number of um, regions that are in focus. For 20x, the result is approximately the same. And, and, I mean, I don't want to go too deep in this analysis. What I want to illustrate is that although pathologists are highly trained individuals, if we really want to get annotations at that level of detail, um, because even two or three people don't agree in, in many instances, we get very noisy training data and can often not make and train classifiers in, in a good way. So this is probably the first work we have done on assessing image quality. There are other image quality measures that are of interest. Um, I've just illustrated that using automatically generated data sets actually is of, is of big value. 
and we've demonstrated some of the example, uh, some of the yeah exact results. For the remainder of the talk, I want to talk about algorithm validation, and um, although this is a slightly technical topic, um, I hope that so far I've sort of motivated that this activity is sort of of great importance if you want to work in this area because nobody will actually accept algorithms that haven't been thoroughly evaluated that sort of give a good indication um, about the, the underlying ground truth data. The various strategies for doing validation there's the obvious strategy of comparing to ground truth. That relates to what is done in the imaging community, and I want to relate to that actually in the end. So we collect a set of reference data, we gather manual annotation, we design comparison matrix. Once we have done that, we can compare algorithms. The difficulty is that some of the biomedical data sets are so large that actually getting good manual annotations is often prohibitive and as I already um, illustrated uh, the, the disagreement between experts can actually be very significant. Another approach which is used um, more recently is um, utilizing edits. Um, so you basically run your algorithm, you um, define a set of edits and I will going to illustrate that to you and then you allow a user to basically correct the algorithm output and basically ask them the question how many edits do you need to get a usable result and then you count the number of edits and that allows you to compare algorithms and I think there's already I've talked to a couple of people there's some reservations about using this method because the original algorithm can already bias the result in a certain way. So the third option is to make an outcome based analysis which is fairly appropriate because we already have certain um, techniques that are established and we can correlate the results of the image analysis algorithms to the known methods that accepted, that's sort of the accepted state of the art. So I want to give you um, examples about these, the two latter validation methods, and then discuss on how we can approach the first one. Yeah, let me get to the point, then we can discuss that. Yeah? Um, because I think that that's a good point. So utilizing edits, I've illustrated the concept already. Um, my slides don't advance. Okay. So what we have worked on, what I've sort of not des described in detail, we have basically developed a number of tracking tools for um, lifestyle imaging, and as I as I mentioned, this is sort of spatial temporal data, and uh, uh, annotating videos in general or, or, or even videos at that level is very laborious so what we proposed is in this context an edit based validation step that essentially provides calculates a sort of track matrix so what you see is you see here that this is the identifier for a certain cell and then you see how long the track is and you can basically then estimate the overall complexity of that track matrix so what you can do you can um, basically then go and have the user cycle through a certain in a certain order through those tracks and can say well look this track ends here and it's in this area of the image can you find another track that should really be connected this one what is the right connection what you can also do, you can, so for instance, say you can learn which track um, transitions look erroneous. So you could, for instance, flag saying, say, I'm not sure if this track is really the right connection. Can you just check if this track should be connected to a different one? So as you see, it's a fairly 
easy um, interface in the sense that the person has already been guided to the right spot in the image, in the right frame, and just has to make some fairly simple decisions. Now, to the validation strategy and outcome-based analysis, and, um, and I think we're going to go back to Pascal's question in a second. I just want to give you a bit of an application context. So um, I think we have a wealth of methods to analyze visual mo motion. And um, what is of interest in this case is to, huh, this video is dark. I'm playing a video, yes. OK. No, no, the video just doesn't. I'm trying to show you the video offline. Hmm. Ah, you see it now? Unfortunately, the video is so overexposed in the projector that you can't really see. So what this is, is um, so I'm trying this. <laughs> so what this is, is um, a sheet of beating cardiomyocytes. So cardiomyocytes are heart cells. And um, what you want to, what, what basically one wants to do is um, When fully differentiated, these cells will start to spontaneously contract. So um, we want to analyze that motion to see if there is any drug-induced cardiotoxicity. So for some of you who might be familiar with the drug Vioxx, um, Vioxx was, um, it was hypothesized that Vioxx causes heart arrhythmias. And the question is, can you study this in model systems fairly early on. Well, the good thing is we propose this sort of concept of basically looking at the visual motion. What you get out, you're getting sort of a motion signal out if you basically do a PCA analysis of the motion fields and you can project it. Um, the question is, is this biologically relevant? Is this really the um, electrical potential you want to see? And um, what, what we are basically going to start doing now is we compare this to something which is called a patch clamp assay. So this is a technique for measurable electrical properties in cells and tissues. So we, you basically have electrodes that come through the bottom of the plastics and sort of stick right into the cells so you can measure um, the electrical potentials in cells um, directly. And this is a well-established technology. It's just very difficult to set up because the cells need to be placed and um, basically set up quite carefully. Now to Pascal's question, is it straightforward to compare signals now from the known method to the used method? I don't think it will be. So what you already saw is that um, we see, for instance, in this kind, we see an aggregate motion. Here we have um, the electrical potential from, from sort of far, uh, smaller groups of cells. But I think what we'll be able to do is changes in electrical potential. If we can map the changes we see in, um, in these kinds of platkamp assays to the changes we see uh, from the optical methods then we can probably say that we will get an adequate and, and, and similar readout. Does that sort of answer your question? So I have about 10 minutes left, and I want to discuss 
a fairly open problem with you and that is the problem of really generating ground truth on a larger set of uh, reference data and use this to actually benchmark where are we currently as a community um, in the terms of segmentation methods and before I do this I want to show you an example of what has been developed in the microarray community so micro, the, the analysis of microarray, these are basically gene expression microarrays um, in the beginning it was quite clear that the results that were generated in the different labs were not comparable, people had problems um, reproducing results that were published so the whole community basically went together and they developed a publication standard for microarray experiments and I don't want to go through this but it's a fairly rigorous um, standard that has been adopted by all the major journals and imagine it's almost equivalent that you want to write um, a PAMI paper that you have to make your data available, you have to make your algorithm available and you, it basically there have to be instructions clear enough for someone else to replicate the experiment otherwise the data derived from that experiment won't be accepted by the community so it's a fairly, um, fairly elaborate process and um, some of it is even more stringent now there are databases that are provided by the, um, in, in the US by the National um, Institute of Health where you have to, you have to submit your data um, and other people will, be, uh, will analyze and pull it off so what would I think is going to be a good area for generated, generating a reference data set I think that the area of histology is probably the most interesting right now because it's of high relevance to basic research as well as to public health meaning clinical studies histology images are already complex enough so that we see all the inherent variation in um, basically human tissue here I, I think we should not go to the methods I have basically intro introduced in the beginning the fluorescence based method this is the sort of traditional H&E staining you see in any kind of pathology lab I think it's a far better known and controlled process and we already have a sizable research community that works in this field and this is by no means a new problem there have been DARPA programs I think in 87 or the early 90s that already tried to develop um, scanners and automated segmentation methods uh, for this kind of data um, what you will hear from people in research as well as clinics that they don't really believe that we can build very reliable segmentation methods for this kind of data sets so in this case and this is why I wanted to present this here it would be very interesting to learn from the sort of um, Pascal um, visual object rec um, recognition challenges and I think on a high level there's a bunch of there's a few differences we really need to take into account first of all the data collection in, in terms of that data set was, was as far as I understand defined on the sort of community consensus the interpretation of the data is not very ambiguous um, many people can sort of agree where the car is in the image or what a bicycle looks like and the annotation can be done by a trained user so it's actually achievable to get a bunch of students explain them how the interface works and get um, annotated data in terms of pathology the data collection is not quite trivial um, one would basically have to comply not only with regulatory requirements but one also should take great care if it's a data set that makes clinical sense the interpretation is as I, highlight, uh, I mentioned before highly ambiguous so we basically have to work on consensus building that's something that has been developed in the medical imaging community and one could probably build on that what is a real uh, problem that we really rely on highly trained experts that need to be convinced to really participate in such a endeavor and sort of need to sort of learn how to use annotation systems like we would build now imagine how many 
how many different objects are in these images that are in, in interest. Pathologists don't really look at every cell. They look at certain regions. They have a very good intuitive understanding where to home in on the image, where to zoom into a finer scale, and where to really look for individual morphological changes. So it, I don't think it's quite clear how we could build this into a data set like this. So this would involve some work. And um, if we wanted to annotate everything, it would really be excessively difficult. Maybe we can basically use segmentation methods to generate some first cut segmentation and have people correct it. I don't know. These are all things I would like to discuss. We are not interested just in segmentation. We are also interested in pathology patterns. So for instance, what you see here, this is what one calls an invasive carcinoma. It has sort of a distinct shape, um, low grade, what is called um, ductal carcinoma in situ for breast cancer, is typically diagnosed around ducts. So ductal regions more or less look like rings, but these rings have different complexity. They are not quite clear, not always just normal donut shapes. And what you also get, these are sort of little events that happen in tissues. You get something what a pathologist would call an Indian file. This is basically a little row of cells that has um, that basically ex has strongly expressed nuclei and is not in an area of the tissue where it's supposed to be. So I think, similar to the Pascal data set, we could come up with multiple different challenges. We could come up with straight segmentation challenges and then also with detection problems. Um, this is some, some something ideas I jotted down for discussion. Um, step one is determining the data set and I think very importantly come up with an incremental path that is still clinically relevant. Yeah. So in a way we don't only want to um, develop segmentation methods, we also want to work on a data set that convinces other people that we have the technical ability to deal with that data. So the next steps are quite contonical, De design the analysis task, agree on performance metrics, and Andrew Sisman already told me that providing evaluation tools is an important um, part of this as well. As my final slide, I just want to put up um, this quote. I think if we develop methods that are robust, that are reliable, we can contribute to something which is referred to as systems biology now. Basically, the, intellection, the interaction between sort of experiment, model analysis, new hypothesis generation, like other technologies, I think imaging can play uh, a fairly important role in this overall framework. And that concludes my talk. I think at the first step it might be useful, um, but really the morphology of every single cell is important. So just knowing the centers of cells is not, it would be basically mimicking a counting task, I think which would be a start, but not. I was just thinking, not, not the whole cells, just cells that have something wrong with them. Just, so all the others are okay, but these are the ones that we shouldn't. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. That could work. So you sort of have, have people highlight certain areas and then take more detailed measurements around those. 